to have you all back. Good to have you all back to Think Tech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. Here to our concluding episode of our uh, total volume of nine about uh, the COVID coronavirus combating complicit uh, courtyard uh, catch, I guess we could say, with all these C's. And so uh, in these days of lockdowns, um, we uh, have been dreaming about these spaces because inside is not working so well anymore. And outside, if people don't stay uh, far enough away from us either. So these sort of uh, indoor, outdoor spaces and places, we've been getting excited about it. We've been revisiting. So um, we're broadcasting live again from opposite ends of the world, me being uh, still back in Germany and uh, in Long Beach, California, we have our mid-century master of courtyards, Ron Lindgren back. Hi, Ron. Hello, Martin. It's been a pleasure to have seen all eight of the previous Courtyard Cabana programs. Well, and you've been an integral and very helpful part of them, so thank you for that one. So let's contemplate while phasing out and bring up the first slide here. I want to quickly uh, update you on uh, the situation here. Uh, our uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel has just been issued a what she calls a lockdown light, which will still be tight enough for us. And so uh, uh, back in my hometown, I've been doing um, basically evidence-based design, life cycle assessment, um, uh, you know, work uh, that I've always been doing. But this year I've been taking my otherwise pretty much locked in their, in their, in their rooms, uh, emerging generation out there and show them around. This is a typology here, which will stay open because it's considered to be essential business. This is a local uh, uh, grocery uh, facility just uh, down the street from my son, Lenny, who was hosting me. And uh, behind this, uh, this, this awning there, which is helping to keep it cool in the summer and all the glazing help to heat it with the sun in the winter time, there's a courtyard that's open to the sky. And we always encourage the clients to potentially grow some of their produce out there on their own roof as a suggestion for post-pandemic um, productions. And the next slide is the other typology, our original initiating typology of public transportation. Um, Lenny, who you see on his bicycle there, um, uh, we spotted this very nice Mercedes-Benz dealer, Ron, that we thought get you excited because it seems like you guys could have been designing that one of your German projects. <laughs> Very nice mid-century piece. And you see uh, our uh, tram station projects we did for the Expo in 2000. Again, I was walking the emerging generation up close uh, to check it out. Um, their public transportation isn't as much of a virus spreader as we think because people are pretty much uh, practicing the distancing and wearing masks different than in when they're just private and they're just, you know, letting all go and just forget about any of the measures we should take these days. So uh, get, let's get to the next slide because uh, then I was telling Lenny about a, a, a childhood memory of when one of my jobs to, uh, in, in, in college was the emergency uh, newspaper delivery guy. Whenever someone got sick, I got up and, and ventured out to neighborhoods that I hadn't been before. And so I uh, remember this one here. And last week we were remembering um, our good uh, colleague and, and friend and hero, Steve Au, who has just passed away. And so it reminded me of another fine character of my culture who we just lost. His name was Uli Stein. He was a cartoonist and he was famous for these mice here that you see at the very, at the very top. And so we drove by uh, with Lenny Citroen, we drove by. We also spotted this, this R4, R4, Renault 4 that they were making from the mid 60s, early 60s till, till late 90s. So for almost 30 years. And, and so its prime time was in the 70s. And so we can only imagine was this house by Uli Stein, who is a brutalist courtyard house. Again, in temperate climate, that's how you grew up, uh, Ron, in the cold heartland. I mean, not you know emotionally cold, but climatically 
called Heartland. And so similar here. And what we're saying, you know, you like that a lot when we were talking before the show because you said this is an exquisite example of the kind of you know evolution of your guys' case study houses back in California in in the 50s and 60s, where you kept the houses rather uh, opaque to the street. There's only this mouse hole slit that you could get, and, and you were saying, "Wow, it seemed really nice and attractive back there, like a little oasis courtyard paradise." So we're saying, if you can do this in cold Germany, we should be able to do this in California and in Hawaii even more, right? I agree. And so let's move on to the next slide. And uh, this is, we're missing DeSoto today, but for a good reason, don't worry, because he has to give a tour at his, uh, at his uh, work. And, and this is his workplace, the Bishop Museum. And, and places that you, Ron, had said, you know, although you've been there multiple times, you haven't discovered them. So they must be somewhere hidden and discreet. So these are the courtyards that uh, DeSoto can share from his very personal uh, everyday live work experience. And the next slide is the, what he, when we started to, to be, get, get ourselves excited about courtyards, this is what he uh, first uh, thought of. And these are the images he provided at the very beginning. And these are uh, additional institutional courtyards of museums. And, and what are your thoughts about museum courtyards, Ron? Yeah, even though I didn't have the pleasure, I've never had the pleasure of seeing what's at the Bishop Museum as far as courtyards, the, the Honolulu Fine Arts Academy is certainly one of my favorite places because for me at least, it solves that general problem that the public has with being just burnt out, museum fatigue. But here, you, you look at the art, you're ready to leave, you don't need to. You glance out into these beautiful courtyards, get refreshed, and go on to the next masterpiece in the museum. Wonderful space. Yeah. yeah, and especially in COVID times, they're especially um, convenient, right? Because you might not, you know, be able to be inside as much as you, you didn't even want to begin with as you were sharing, but probably not even less and, and courtyards let you breathe again, literally and figuratively speaking. So um, let's go to the next slide and have you run sort of recap uh, one of your most famous courtyards. And in this show, we want to conclude because we said, you know, in Hawaii and probably anywhere else, we got to keep the country country and make the city a city. So you guys and you in particular as well with this project have been doing urban courtyards. And let's recap your masterpiece, Hela Kalani, a little bit to that regard, Ron. Yeah, uh, the privilege I had to work on the Hala Kalani, uh, I, I really consider it the thing that I'm most proud of. But in designing the Hale Klani Hotel, my Japanese client only had one one sentence program requirement besides the number of guest rooms. And that was that I would create a luxurious, elegant and quiet sanctuary in the heart of busy high rise Waikiki. So my first response was almost knee jerk in that I said, well, let's wall off uh, Waikiki with some single order guest room corridor buildings on the three perimeters, leaving the fourth perimeter op open to the ocean. So for the first, and unfortunately the last time in my architectural career, I wasn't just designing a building in space, but I was creating spaces with buildings. And of course, those spaces were courtyards. And if you look up at the uh, upper left, this is a view of one of the two courtyards as seen from the hotel's vehicle entry, which is the Port Cochere. So from the Port Cochere, you step out of your car, go up a few steps, and suddenly you're looking out over an expansive lawn, a swimming pool terrace, and the open ocean beyond. And then on the upper right is the second courtyard. Now that one happens to be uh, the hotel's pedestrian entrance, which I created as an open air uh, tiled roof pavilion. And the lawns in the view are extending to what is the hotel's prime jewel, and that is uh, C.W. Dickey's 1932 Lures House, which we completely renovated and remodeled. Uh, and that too was the only time in my career where I got to, to take on the challenge and the merit of historic preservation. You wanna to move to the next slide, Ron? Yeah, let's move to the next slide, please. Uh, the next slide, at the lower right is showing the site plan for the hotel 
and uh, the two courtyards are identified. Uh, and again, those courtyards are facing out to the south and to the open ocean. That swimming pool courtyard shows up on the uh, upper or on the lower left uh, with one of Ed Kellysworth's desired swimming pool designs, which are always oval. And then my happy contribution is up on the uh, on the upper right because most of the public circulation at the ground level of the hotel is in, is in covered porticos as shown here. And they were designed to simulate the sort of measure, measured cadence of walking through gardens or alongside a cloistered uh, courtyard. Courtyard, courtyard, courtyard. What an opportunity at the Holly Colony. And the next slide, here's where Martin, you'll probably want to jump in too. Uh, at the lower right, the hotel did have a few Juliet balconies. In other words, the kind you step out uh, and catch a breath of air or the window cleaner steps out and cleans the windows. But what it's really showing is that instead of musky draperies in the tropics, that uh, we use sliding wood doors with operable wood louvers. And they're a fine tropical alternative to you know, musky curtains. And all, every guest room, uh, might have had a Juliet balcony, but if it did, it would also have had a full-size outdoor room, a full manai. And that's where the hotel encouraged the guests to indulge in room service meals. When, when the hotel serves breakfast to these uh, guests at a luxury hotel, this is an incredible source of hotel profit. At the lower left, we're showing the Orchids restaurant, which is located in the Lures house. And right at the most desirable designing locations, or the dining locations, that is those with the best diamond head view or the ocean view, we built additional designing uh, dining spaces with informal waterproof fabric roofs, as you see, and they were stretched over minimal steel frames. This was a wonderfully informal way to have those outer dining areas. At, at the upper left, Martin, you might remember that on a very early morning, uh, you took a picture down Lewers Road to show what is one of my proudest, proudest design moments at the Holly Colony. And that's the fact that when a visitor first sees the hotel at the southern end of Lewers Road, where it makes a T intersection with Kalia Road, the initial experience is memorably low key and surprisingly residential. All that the first uh, timer sees is open sky above an elegant Hawaiian home sheltered beneath the dicky roof. Uh, in that same picture in the upper left is a waterfall feature that I developed uh, as you walk up the steps to the entry pavilion for pedestrians. And it's a waterfall that completely uh, wipes out any noise that comes from the street. The upper right, this is, this is a, a sort of painful photo for me because we all know that in the planned upcoming renovation of the hotel, which is going to happen sometime during the pandemic lockdown, I'm really hoping that original features aren't lost. And here I'm standing in front of outdoor drapery and some beautiful custom lighting fixtures. And they add such a fine residential character to the experience of the hotel at the Holly Clowney that I hope in the remodeling that that isn't lost. Absolutely, and, and thanks for sharing, you know, walking us through this slide here, just making us aware of and reminding us that good architecture gets better the closer you get to it. So, you know, not just the macro of a courtyard form and performance is important, but it's detailing and it's fine grained that you guys, that you, you masterfully did. And since the show wants to, if anything, encourage the audience to discover more along the same subjects, Ron, we got us, um, you know, back and forth excited about another courtyard master who was Joseph Eichler. And you in particular went out and bought books and did some more studying and, and threw the next couple of slides in. And let's go to the next one. Yeah, uh, in the spirit of humane and healthy architecture that incorporates courtyards, our main topic for the last nine weeks, I believe that another topic from a previous program deserves greater scrutiny. And as you are saying, I'm speaking of the many tracked housing courtyard homes that Joseph Eichler built. 
At the age of 45, Eichler began an entirely new career. He ultimately built 11,000 homes in track subdivisions in the San Francisco Bay region. This was the mid-century modern era of the 50s and 60s. Now, he, uh, he actually managed, and that's his, his, uh, why he's such a hero to me. He delivered affordable, mass-produced houses that retained the look and the feel of much more expensive custom homes for middle-class buyers who couldn't themselves afford the personal service of architects. Also, the homes were distinctive for being consistently very modern in appearance. They had innovative features and affordable construction techniques. For example, in the slides, you can see there that exposed post and beam construction was used. And that allowed for a very quick erection and flat uh, plan flexibility indoors and a sort of clear stripped down order to both the exterior and the interior spaces. A nearly industrial process of mass construction was created in which each house site was a stationary assembly line. 12 building crews, each with a different construction specialty, arrived at the site at set times from the beginning to the remarkably rapid completion of each house. More so, standard construction details, for example, for doors or windows and roofs, were used no matter what type of house was being built. Some building materials were prefabricated, such as the Philippine mahogany plywood panels, which covered almost all interior walls. Uh, slab on grade foundations contained radiant heat piping in the concrete. And frankly, that was a largely post-war innovation. But of greatest interest to us is the fact that open interior planning was paired with indoor outdoor relationships through entire walls of glass. The most salient and popular feature of these homes was the inclusion of a private outdoor atrium. Now atrium actually originally just meant a central hall in an ancient Roman house, but uh, for, for Eichler's sales marketing team, it was a fancy word for, you guessed it, courtyard. Though many Eichler homes were flat roofed, the most popular models incorporated sheltering gabled roofs and a comforting evocation of, of the traditional house form. People were just comfortable with that. And Eichler relied completely on architects Robert Anshin and A. Quincy Jones uh, for the home designs and for the site planning for all of his modern housing tracks. And also very unusual for the time, landscape architects developed the properties fully from lot line to lot line because usually the developer left the ground around the house to weeds and the imagination of the new owners. Now, each new housing tract and their individual home designs were constantly studied so that they could be improved upon from the lessons learned from what they perceived as successes and failures. This included the very careful study of post owner evaluations as to livability and consumer satisfaction. Next slide, please. In the upper left, next to uh, Martin's bare face, is Joseph Eichler himself. Besides pioneering new home construction techniques, Eichler was the very first speculative post-war developer to incorporate real community planning methods into his subdivisions. Now, generally, other people of his ilk building subdivisions would simply strive to jam as many one-eighth or one quarter acre home sites onto a property as was possible. But Eichler correctly felt, and I quote him, fostering social coherence and buyer satisfaction meant reforming the land use and physical planning of suburban residential landscapes. In his developments, there was a higher density of housing than usual. And this freed up some open spaces for communal use. Also homes were often planned in clusters so they could preserve some shared open space for common facilities right in the center of the housing tract. Now, these amenities included things like shared landscapes of a wooded park, recreation center buildings, a nursery school, tennis courts, and a swimming pool. Importantly, a feeling of community spirit would grow up around the idea of shared owner investment. Now that might seem old hat, but at the time, that was a very new idea in the 50s and 60s, 
shared owner investment in where you live. Uh, if you look at the lower left, he also used unusual roadway and cul-de-sac arrangements. And they were provided, one of the most unusual, which was actually built, was this concentric ring pattern. And it conveyed to residents a sense of sharing in a larger whole. In other words, your house was part of the circle or part of the arc. Uh, and it also slowed traffic down considerably. And that greatly increased children's safety when just playing outdoors or, or walking home from school, like the two kids there on, at the lower right. All power lines were buried below grade. And that also was a relatively new practice for beautifying housing tracks. Next slide, please. The vast majority of housing tracks had no, uh, or I should say, Eichler's modern housing tracks did not have racial covenants, but the vast majority of those people who were mass housing merchant builders and their banks and lenders, they wanted, I quote, homogenous, stable uh, neighborhoods which would hold their property values. These very fine sounding words are actually racial dog whistles, which mean, of course, simply that no people of colors or, Jew, uh, of, or Jews would be allowed to live there. For Eichler, his anti-discriminatory stance wasn't really a personal crusade, but just part of his conventional business practice. That liberal practice included the hiring of handicapped workers when possible, and also employing furloughed convicts as day laborers and apprentice carpenters. In summary, Joseph Eichler, someone I'm ashamed to say that I knew nearly nothing about, goes from zero to hero for me, having built neighborhoods that brought the look and spirit of the case study houses to affordable track developments. Next slide, please. And that's yours. <laughs> well, it's ours. And you said you don't recall that space. And it might have been around when, or not anymore, when you were working in the heart of our city in Honolulu. This gets us back to the urban because we want to encourage courtyards to be implemented also in the heart of the city. This was in what's well, now Kaka'ako, and this is by Hogan and Chapman, mostly known for their fine Pan Am building on Kapiolani Boulevard. But also on the right side, uh, which you remember, as you said, you had one of your consultants having his office in there. That was Steve Au's very fine Ward Plaza that unfortunately was torn down fairly, fairly recently. So these are so, great. One of my, one of, it's not a failure, but when I had meetings with my electrical consultant who had an office there, I think on the second floor, I always got there early, so early that I could sit in that courtyard and decompress and enjoy the wonderful space before I went up to sometimes very contentious meetings with consultants. Yeah, no, you're right. And so having to speed up and, and conclude here, let's go to the next slide. Uh, once again, I almost forgot a courtyard we've been doing for mentally disabled children, actually a multitude of different courtyards, open ones to the sky, covered ones with a new innovative material of ETFE, or uh, another one with that same material on the, on the bottom right that's open to the ends. So the kids, as you can see, they're bundled up in, in cold climate, could still enjoy the outdoors. So that in mind, next slide. Um, remembering Steve Owl for many things, but as well for what he had proposed for uh, Kaka'ako, which you can call pretty much stackmanize of courtyard T character. And that reminded us very much of the proposal, uh, Ron, you guys have been done and you've been sharing, which we see at the bottom right, which were high rise stackmanize for Singapore, right? I was struck by the similar similarity of Steve Owl's plan for that stack lanized housing as it related to the plan of one of the penthouse units at the Singapore condominium that we built. Very similar in having many different prospects, yeah. a lot of light and air coming in from all directions. Yeah, that, and you said so nicely, yet you built, you should have built, and one should build this like they should build um, the uh, Steve Al Towers, at least one of them. And we we're saying, you know, Howard, you should do that, but also Kamehameha School, the other large landowner on the island, they should 
do one of these as a tribute to, to Steve. Let's go to the next slide, Ron, and, and you recap um, pretty much how you took that original mid-century case study house courtyard theme of Ed and friends and how you basically evolve that through your body of work, which we see on, so let's walk through these quick, Ron. Yeah, the fact is that the success of uh, projects that came out of the Killingsworth office, uh, they had a, a, a single common uh, feature, and that was the use of courtyards. But the fact is that memorable hotel courtyards could be of several different types. For example, at the bottom right is the Ihilani Hotel, where the courtyard is a very vertiginous 17-story atrium. To the lower left is Larry Stricker's design for a lobby atrium, which was open to the sky. We discussed this sadly because the original tropical experience there that you see on the very far left was uh, an evocation of a Hawaiian paradise, but it's been lost in a recent urban gentrification. Up at the upper left, you see the 1967 Kahal apartments. And there, the, there were courtyards that were only 30 foot wide between four foot high uh, apartments or condominiums. The privacy was provided only by the fact that those courtyards were filled with tall, dense tropical planet or uh, landscape. And you can see the, the Kahala Hilton off in the distance from our good friend and very fine photographer's apartment, Andrea Brizzi. And last at the uh, upper right is another type of courtyard we really haven't discussed. That's a motor courtyard. This, this was a model view of the Kapalua Bay Hotel which does not exist anymore, but to create a memorable arrival experience there, a very large uh, classically square motor court was built with an open portico structure that went all the way around it and was hung with flowering and scented vines. Uh, I was a project architect on that hotel and I miss it dearly. Next slide. We, we do too, Ron, and let's tear down what they replaced it with and rebuild yours. <laughs> what I suggest. So uh, having to phase out here, I just want to quickly share where this could, you know, where this tradition could evolve and how your guys, uh, you know, legacy could live on through the emerging generation. This here is again referring to at the very bottom left, uh, starting with Ed, you know, he made this brilliant courtyard proposal for indigenous Latin American, uh, you know, people that also wasn't built. And in that tradition, we developed along the same lines, the uh, basically clustered cargo courtyard cabanas where you use cargo steel, you stack them on top of each other, always leaving the void of the by one and one free uh, methodology. Next slide is uh, what we call the stratosphere Lanai Grove where you take two shipping containers space them out that they form a square and then while going building up you rotate that always shifting them 90 degrees so not only do you create a central courtyard but you're also creating lanai courtyards in between that utilize the roof of your neighbor below and last but not at all least at the very uh, last picture here this is primitiva one which is pretty much an extruded donut and has this very long linear a courtyard that um, what you see behind me, that little surreal picture looks pretty psychedelic Halloween coming up. We're suggesting to every so three to four floors to knit in the stainless steel uh, mesh that that would, uh, you know, function as a trampoline for for the kids uh, and, and provide safety and, and a lot of fun. So what we're trying to say, Ron, is that again, there is a rich tradition of courtyards around the world, the Roman, the Greek, the Egyptian, uh, the Chinese, you name them, and the American very recently, as you have been masterly uh, manifesting. And we, we urge the emerging generation to pick it up from there and come up with their very own uh, courtyard theme interpretations which again, seems so timely in, in the clause of COVID to be in these beautiful places that you're outdoors, you're easy breezy and easy breezy. So we say that's the way to go and create more shows for your own, make volume 11, 12 and so on about courtyards. And uh, until then, uh, Ron, 
stay, um, you know, pray for next week, election day. Also stay cool, literally and figuratively, because the wildfires have been picked up. So in all of that, uh, keep up your great sanity and safety. And uh, see you soon for another show. As you know, we won't let you off the hook. So there are more to come in the future. Thanks for the good wishes. Bye now. All right. Bye-bye.